kick off our culminating storytelling event with NYCHA. Thank you to the NYCHA team that helped pull this all together, to the Samuels Foundation, to New York State Council on the Arts, to the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council for making this possible. And most importantly, thank you to the incredible storytellers who have participated in Life Story Club's programming this year. Our storytellers today all know our wonderful host and facilitator, Stephanie Yanis, but we're such a small team at Life Story Club that we always get to hear how incredible this group is from Stephanie. So today is just particularly special that we get together. And to this group, I'd love to start us off by sharing with you my story and how our paths ended up crossing here today. So I'm Chinese American. My parents grew up during China's cultural revolution in the 60s and 70s. This was a period of social political upheaval led by the Communist Party. And the political movement was all about the rise of the proletariat class, but it was also about destroying traditions. And so book burning was sadly a big thing. And this included destroying family photos, other family artifacts. So we never had documentation on my family. I didn't even know the names of my great grandparents. Until several years ago, when we reconnected with my larger family back in China. And, and we're gonna show a little photo here. Um, uh, my family visited my ancestral home in Wenzhou, China. And we had discovery. We found out that our family has a family tree book that dates back to the 1600s. It was a complete miracle that it had survived the cultural upheaval. And in the book, there are stories. There's stories of different family members, who they were and what their contributions were. And I was so inspired by this that I began listening to and capturing the stories of all the elders in my life. I brought storytelling to some of the nursing homes and senior centers I volunteered at. And I would have groups of older adults meet and share life stories together. And I would help them document those stories with audio recordings as keepsakes for themselves and their families. And these groups became really, really popular. Ultimately, I think we all have an innate need to feel a sense of belonging and connection and to contribute to something greater than ourselves. And in these groups, you're so quickly engaging in meaningful conversation and finding commonalities with others. And so towards the end of 2019, I created Life Story Club as a nonprofit. And just in time too, because the past year and a half has shown us how critical social connectivity is. Our social relationships are really the lattice of support that underpins our physical and mental health. And it's these relationships that give us our sense of purpose, fulfillment, and identity. And at Life Story Club, we want people to know that socialization is self-care. Now we're a small but mighty team, and this is actually just a snapshot of what we do. We provide storytelling opportunities like this for seniors here in New York City through partnerships with community centers, senior centers, libraries. And we also work with geriatric care providers to offer our programming virtually for individuals across the country, especially those who are homebound or more at risk for isolation. And we're just getting started. Today, our team is just so grateful that the NYCHA senior champions and their fellow resident storytellers are sharing with us a glimpse into the heart of this community. Thank you again, and we're looking forward to more programming with NYCHA next year. Now I'd like to pass the floor to NYCHA's Deputy Director of Resident Engagement, Michelle George, who also has a few words to share. Thank you so much, Lily. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am Tishelle George, Deputy Director with NYCHA's Resident Engagement Department, and it is an absolute pleasure to be here with you today. Um, I also want to extend my thanks to the Life Story Club um, for being such an amazing partner, um, to the Samuels Foundation for providing the funding for us to work together, um, as well as the New York City Council on the Arts and the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council. Um, we have many of our colleagues here today from the Resident Engagement Department, which is led by Janelle Hudson, and I want to extend my thanks and appreciation to you for supporting this event today. Um, but I also want to extend a special thank you to um, the Resident Programs Unit, which is led by Ray Hooks. Um, who unfortunately was not able to be here today, um, but I'm, you know, I'm here to, to represent, along with a huge thank you to the community coordinators 
who have worked so closely with our senior champions during some of the most trying times in our city, um, but they've brought them away to socialize and to validate their lived experiences through participation in the Life Story Club. And so I really wanna give a big um, heartfelt thank you to Shelton Collins, to Myra Miller, and to Nancy Quinones um, for the work that you are doing um, with the Senior Champions and with the Life Story Club. Um, if you are not already familiar with the NYCHA Senior Champions, um, I can tell you a little bit about it. A NYCHA Senior Champion is a resident who has assumed a leadership role in his or her development and what they're doing is helping to enhance the quality of life for themselves and for their neighbors, other seniors who are living in the community. Many NYCHA residents age in place, right? It means that they live there for the duration of their lives. And, you know, they may start off, you know, as a, you know, a young person or even as a child, maybe born into the community, but it is a place that they call home and continue to call home even as they, you know, go into their senior years. The senior champions work with other NYCHA residents. They work with NYCHA um, employees to help activate community projects, to meet a need um, in the community, to help connect other seniors to resources, and really to just help enhance the lived experience for the seniors who are in our community. They're really the, the bedrock, the foundation of the community. And this is, this is the best way that I can think of to you know, really highlight how impactful seniors are at NYCHA through the Life Story Club because it gives them a chance to share you know, really poignant parts of their life with, with all of us. And I just wanna thank every storyteller who is here with us today. Thank you for sharing with us. I'm so looking forward to learning from you um, and thank you for being a part of this amazing program that we have with the Life Story Club. Thank you. And with that, am I, am I passing it on to Trevor? I think we're going back to Stephanie. Yes. Hey, everyone. All right, thank you so much to Shell. Appreciate you. And as always, it is such an honor and a blessing to work, work with the NYCHA team. Um, so thank you so much. So today, bienvenidos, welcome. This is this event, we're gonna do Spanglish. So be prepared to hear a little bit of Spanish, be prepared to hear lots of English, but it's gonna be a blend of both because today is a culminating event. It's a celebration of the community that we have built here. Hoy celebramos nuestra comunidad. The stories you hear today have been carefully thought out and are important to our NYCHA storytellers. For the past several weeks, we have worked together in two groups, a Spanish speaking group and an English speaking group. And we have an action packed agenda. So uh, just, you know, we might run over an hour. Um, so if you can stay, please stay, um, but we understand. So I wanted to give an opportunity real quick to highlight all of our storytellers that have been engaged throughout um, these past, uh, these several weeks. So I want to give a quick shout out to our, um, to our, our group, um, our Spanish speaking group, Honorina, Carmen, Digna, Linares, Fernanda, Rosa, Mari, Rafaela, Rafael, Joaquin, and the NYCHA staff that was always there giving us all the, their awesome stories, Nancy and Myra. And then I also want to give a shout out to all of our, um, to our Friday group, um, Carolyn, Senza, Ms. Roberta Keys, Nanny, Birdie, Donna Gibson, Sharon C, Sharon G, Cynthia, Colleen, Gwendolyn Primus, Linda, Bertha, Esperanza, Yolanda, Ruben, and the NYCHA staff that was always um, a present, Ray, Shelton, Andre, Nancy, and Myra. Thank you guys. Um, and thank you all for all of you who are on the line supporting each other today. I really appreciate the community that we have built. And um, 
uh, quickly, I would like to also do a quick shout out to one of our storytellers who will be sharing a story, but um, has been re has been featured in our latest chat book with NYCHA. And I would like uh, for Miss Maria Pacheco uh, to show us her book. She has her book with her. Maria, if you want to hold up your book. Woohoo! I told I, Maria said that she could write a book with all the things that she's done. And I tell her, we're, we're doing it. We're going to do it. We're just getting it started. Right, Maria? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, I appreciated you coming over so you can actually see and witness what we go through in a senior building. Yeah. Anybody could write a book. <laughs> Absolutely, Maria. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Maria is going to be our grand finale, so you don't want to miss out. And she is the grand finale for a reason. So thank you, Maria. Okay, you're welcome. Okay, now let's give a warm welcome to all of our storytellers for today. Um, this is our lineup. Um, I want to give a welcome to this group of very diverse, talented, and special storytellers. You are all about to hear powerful and beautiful stories of resilience, bravery, advocacy, and triumph. So please feel, um, be prepared to feel inspired by all of these amazing stories. Um, so our first storyteller is going to be Reverend Samuels. And once you hear his voice, you can't help but love um, the Rev. He's a fan favorite to whoever gets a chance to hear him speak. Um, and his story about advocacy is one that will surely inspire everyone to stand up for what's right. Unfortunately, Reverend Samuels had a family emergency last night and wasn't able to be here, but we have his story and we would like to share it with all of you today. So just give us a few minutes to get all of that together. apartheid in South Africa. We knew nothing about apartheid at first until the songbird of Africa came to this country, Miriam Makiba, and she sang some wonderful selections. And then she started telling stories about her country and her husband, Huma Sakela, he was a trumpet player. And so from that, a lot of stories appeared on TV, on the news. And I saw some horrendous things that happened, or I should say that should not happen to any human being or animal. I saw the illegal government <sighs> imposed apartheid on the indigenous people who were the majority. I've seen them beat them with nightclubs, young boys, teenagers, and they showed one that his head had been beaten so bad that when they touched it, it was soft like a soft tomato. All of the bone inside of his skull was broken. I sat there as a grown man and I cried. Tears ran down my face and I prayed and I shouted to God, Lord, you got to do something. Why do you allow this? Then as this situation went viral, it was like wildfire all over the place and a lot of people of goodwill, black, white, everyone in this country and in other countries rose up and decided to denounce apartheid. And I remember there was a protest movement, quite a few in a lot of states here. And I participated in that movement, the demonstration. Well, at that time, I was a student at New York City Technical College, and I was also involved with theater works. We were doing, practicing, or rehearsing for 
a production called My Fair Lady. And I was supposed to be there for the rehearsal, but I was marching. So when the march was over, as a matter of fact, a lot of professors were in the march as well. When the march was over, I went to my rehearsal, but I was late. And the director looked at me and she was a little indignant. And she asked me, Mr. Edwards, why are you late? And I told her that I was in a demonstration against apartheid. And she shot back to me and she said, that has nothing to do with you. You should not have been late. That has nothing to do with it. And I told her, I said, look, apartheid is illegal and what they're doing to black people in their own country is wrong. The people are not free. And if one black person is not free, none of us are free. So she said nothing. And a few years later, Nelson Mandela and Winnie Mandela, they were in control of the ANC, which spearheaded the movement in South Africa, the African National Congress. They came to Brooklyn. And at Boys and Girls High School, and they spoke, and there were thousands of people. And I sat there, as a matter of fact, during the demonstration, my son, who works in City Hall right now in the controller's office, he was in a stroller during the demonstration. And when they appeared at Boys and Girls High School, and Nelson Mandela was a free man, and apartheid had been overthrown. There was a feeling of relief and a feeling of joy, not only in my heart, but in the hearts of all of the wonderful people of goodwill. And like I said, it wasn't just black people demonstrating. It was people of all goodwill, white, black, red, yellow, from all over the place. And that will always be indelible on my mind. Thank you. Reverend. <laughs> Thank you so much, Reverend Samuels. I know he's here in spirit and um, we appreciate him sharing with us. Um, and he sends all of us um, his love. Now, our next speaker is Miss Ona. Now, we have Miss Ona who always has something positive to say. She has been such a vibrant member of our group with her sweet Southern self. Her powerful and brave story about standing up while sitting in is sure to leave you in awe. So please give a warm welcome to Ms. Ona. Hey, Ona. Hello. Hi. Okay. My name is Ona Huskins Burrell, and I'm originally from Durham, North Carolina, and a graduate of Hillside High School. Well, it all began for me in February 1960 when they had a civil rights sit-in movement that started in Greensboro, North Carolina, and it sp spread it very quickly. News spread it very quickly around the campus of uh, North Carolina College, which is now North Carolina Central University, regarding who wanted to participate in the uh, sit-in at the counters of F.H. Crest store, F.W. Woodworth, and, and Walgreen. And, of course, my late friend Sybil Benton Johnson and I participated. I had experienced nothing during that time but to sit at the back of the bus, drink water from designated fountains, one said colored and one said white, separate entrance to restaurants and to the bus station, attend black schools, and to stand behind Caucasian people in the name stores when ordering food, and to stand behind them when we had to eat them because colored, that's what we were called during that time, colored people were not allowed to eat at the counter. 
in uh, February of 1960, people wanted to pre- protest to, um, well, we had we had a meeting and we had to get together at, at a designated place to know what we were going to do. And we knew that this was a nonviolent movement, so whatever our leader said to do, we knew that we had to do that. So we gathered at the three stores. We had a group to go to Crest, a group to go to Walgreens, and I remember I was at uh, uh, Woodmore, Woodworth. So we silently waited to be served, and we knew that we would not be served. We were told that we were not going to be served and asked to leave. Well, we didn't. So the policemen came, and they told us the same thing, that we had to leave, and we didn't leave. So we were arrested for disorderly conduct, trespassing, and disturbing the peace. So I, along with the other protesters, we all had to walk to the courthouse because there were so many of us. They didn't have enough uh, police cars to accommodate the protesters. So I know I was charged with guilty of trespassing. I was fingerprinted and put in a cell with other protesters. So all of us stayed there for quite a while. We were there for quite a while. And we had to wait until our lawyers, and I remember one lawyer's name was Floyd McKissett, and our a bail bondsman could take care of the process. And after they did, we were, were released. So after that, I'm sure the protesters, we did our share. There were legal action that the lawyers had to do. So I would say to myself, you know, in the end, was the sit-in movement successful? I would say yes, and in the end, was a positive result. The thing that, two things that are that just stay with me was the evening that uh, I met our Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. He was a guest speaker at our high school, the Hillside High School, and our uh, choir from uh, North Carolina College sponsored the music. And, of course, I was a member of the North Carolina College Choir. And uh, I was just so happy because, you know, we all knew who Dr. Martin Luther King was, but to see him with my own two eyes. So the most memorable, memorable historical part was that I will never forget that that I, that being a part of the civil rights movement, sitting at that lunch counter, experiencing that, and then knowing that it ended with a positive result, and to know that I helped helped to make a difference or a change in history, a historical change or a difference, whichever one you want to say. But I I want to say I want my adult children, my grandchildren, and my five great-granddaughters to be proud to know that I helped to make a difference, a change in our United States of America. And I'd like to say thank you to uh, Stanley Isaac Senior Citizen Center. They made it available a couple of years ago so that we could go down to the National Museum of African American History Culture in Washington, D.C., and I was able to sit at the counter and see the movie of the city and movement that happened in Greensboro, North Carolina. And I thank you all for listening. Thank you so much, Ona. Beautiful, beautiful story. Appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you, Ona. All right. Um, great stories today. I'm. I'm Really excited to um, present our next speaker is Miss Brenda Pope, and her name is so fitting to her, and you are all about to discover why. Um, we are also going to listen to uh, Brenda um, now, so if you could just give us a few minutes to just a few moments to um, pull up the audio for Miss Brenda Pope. Again? I if I can remember it's been a while ago, I, I was coming from the clinic, so this lady got on the 18 bus right on 58 and Roosevelt Avenue. So she just started talking to me that she had an appointment for a job and everything. So we were just talking like we knew each other for a long time. So I was telling, you know, you just put your trust in God, you know, everything would be good. You would get that job and things. And I asked her, did she need anything or money, you know, get the bus or the plane back on? She told me, you know, and she was thanking me just sit there and just listen to what she was going through and stuff. You know, I made her comfortable. I said, you know what? You're going to get that job. You know, it's for you. And she appreciated that so much. 
that, you know, I would listen to her, even though I'd never seen this lady in my life. And we felt comfortable talking to each other like we knew each other for a long time. i never seen the lady. And I felt comfortable telling her that, you know, you just got to believe and put your trust in God and you will get that job and stuff. No, for she, I think she had two or three kids. I'm not for sure. But I think in my heart that the lady really did get the job. But she wouldn't take anything from me. But some people, you know, she said, I'm fine. I'm doing okay. Just wishing me luck on the job. So I did. I prayed for it and everything while I was going home that she will get that job. So in my heart, I really think the lady got the job for her and her kids. She was living in a shelter also. So she said she really knows she need that job to take care of her family. Thank you, Brenda. I love that story because how many of us have those stories of either you needed that inspiration and someone, a stranger or whoever it was, was able to, you know, give you that light, right? Yes. Yes. You have to have compassion for people too. Mm -hmm. You don't have to know them. Sometimes a person needs someone to listen to what they're going through. Maybe you can give them advice. You tell them, just pray on this situation. Do you believe in God? You know, do you have the faith? Do, are you a believer? You know, you give the other people hope. They can give you hope too. Also, you might be going through things also, you know. And sometimes you feel comfortable with a person telling what you've been through and how you, you know, you made it through God. He was there for you and things like that. And I know when uh, I left my husband in 85, so I stayed with my brother. I was working, I had kids. I used to, have to be to work at 7 o'clock in the morning. I used to get the kids ready to say, I said, I don't know how well I made it. But thank God, now as I got all I realized that God was with me. He was carrying me through the, the pain and suffering I was going through. And then my husband, he wasn't bound, but he was schizophrenic and stuff. So I was scared, so I left and stayed with my brother for years. Then the little ones I had to send out to my mother-in-law so she could take care of them stuff. But you know what? God made a way. I have six kids. Every last one graduate from high school. Three went to college, and the rest of them, they got decent jobs. You know, it won't number God that brought me through with my kids. He was there when I need him, and I know he always there with me that I need him. Through thick and through thin. And I tell praise God, wherever I have, I don't have. I know he provides everything that I have. And like I said, I had sister-in-laws and, and uh, brother-in-laws down there, but no one didn't help me but one of my of my uh, sister-in-law, and to this day, we just like sisters, even though we, you know, sister-in-law, and we treat each other with respect, and she was the only one there for me and my kids when they was younger, when I really need them and stuff. So I thank God for them. I thank God for always been there for me and my family. So I praise God each and every day that he never gave up on me and stuff. Like you said, he said we he would never leave us forsaken us. You know, he give us peace and joy in our life. When we go through hard times, we look for him for help, for joy and peace in our life. So even today, I have peace, joy, and happiness in my life. And I praise to God each and every day when I get up. Sometimes I forget during the morning, but as days go by, I walk, I praise, I thank him in my head how good he is. You know, I'm so blessed to have him in my life. We all need that in our life. So I just thank him each and every morning. I thank him for people. I praise for everyone in the world, not just my family. And praise for those who lost their loved ones from the pandemic. You know, he's a source of our life. So wherever we're going through, we give it to him and believe that he will hear our prayer. And he had heard my cry and prayer all these many years, and he still hear my prayer and cry. So I just say hallelujah and amen for that. And that's my testimony for today. Yeah. I give testimony. Again? <laughs> Thank you so much, Ms. Brenda Pope. Brenda's on the line today too. Um, and, you know, I just, I, I love her voice. And thank you, Brenda, again. Appreciate you for sharing.
Okay, up next, tenemos la maravillosa Lidia. Um, Lidia is always smiling and always so kind, and she represents Washington Houses. So um, please welcome Lidia. You will be hearing her, her story. It is in Spanish. I will be sharing some translations. So please just give me a moment as we pull up the audio and the translations for the story. Bueno, yo nací en Arecibo, entonces mi, mis padres se separaron, entonces estuve un tiempo con mi mamá en Arecibo y yo estaba ansiosa por conocer a mi papá, entonces él supo donde yo vivía, vino a visitarme y es, él vivía en Mayagüez. So vino, hablamos, hablamos, me comió el corazón y entonces me fui a vivir parte de mi vida con él. Tenía unos 13 años. Después de ahí estuve viviendo con él de 13 años hasta los 19 que me casé y vine aquí a Nueva York. Siempre, nunca tuve la dicha de tener los papás juntos. Pero anyway, compartí con los dos. Entonces, llegué aquí a Nueva York en julio 19, no, no, diciembre 29 de 1969, no, 68, oh, I'm sorry, estoy cometiendo error. Entonces, eh, eh, tuve la tristeza que se nos quemó el apartamento en la 127, y Lexington. Ya yo estaba embarazada de mi hija, tenía seis meses. Entonces, la Cruz Roja nos ayudó y nos buscó apartamento y tuvimos la dicha de llegar a Washington House. En este mismo apartamento que estoy viviendo tengo 53 años. Llegamos en julio 19 de 1969 hasta ahora. Déjame decirte que estoy feliz de vivir aquí en el barrio. Me encanta mi apartamento. Eh, mis vecinos de Washington House están en mi corazón, especialmente la gente mayor, que son las que yo ayudo mucho. Y siempre estoy pendiente a ellas. Pero en esta pandemia he perdido mucho. Y quiero decirte que Estoy feliz aquí donde estoy, en el barrio y Washington House. Yo adoro Washington House. Y estoy feliz. Crié a mis hijos, tienen su profesión. Ayudé a mis hijos con mis nietos, que estoy orgullosa de ellos. Y aquí estamos. Ya mi historia acabó. Adoro, los quiero a Washington House y todos mis vecinos y mis amistades de mucho, mucho, mucho tiempo. Los quiero mucho. ¡Uhú, Lidia! Dale duro, Lidia. Muchas gracias, Lidia, por compartir con nosotros. Ok. Um, ahora tenemos... Um, And now, I'm sorry, now I have to switch back to English. Um, up next, we have our lovely participant. We have Miss Mercy, um, whose commitment to faith, family, her children, and education is always present in everything she says. So please welcome Miss Mercy. Hold on, Mercy. Let me make sure you're unmuted. Hold on one second. We can't hear you. Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. Okay, okay, there you go. Okay. Happy Friday to everybody. I am Mercy Ponea from Sri Lanka. My story goes back to 1978 with the passing away of my father at the age of 57 plus. The house rent was too high at that time, could not look for a convenient spot, but forcefully moved to the land which 
our dad bought a few years ago. All that was a mud house with a tiled roof. It was a little village which had no electricity, no tap ball water. The transportation was very poor and sometimes we had to walk for more than a half mile to the bus stop. Trusting God to know that the, all things work together for the good and that love God to the children of God, we managed to forego our comforts. In 1979, I started a good news club with eight neighborhood children, which grew to 110 children in a vacation Bible school was conducted in 1981. Beside, we opened a weekly Bible study for adults. No, the community was so was surrounded with illicit arak, brewers and charmers, soothsayers, and with Buddhist temples. By this time, the mud house was enlarged with more facilities. My marriage to Abraham took place in 1983, January, and I settled down on the tea plantation, plantation area, which was my comfort zone. Then we heard the mobile attack on the July 19, 29th, burning down the house. Burning down the house we lived. There was no enmity with the neighbors other than for two reasons. One, ethnic, ethnic violence because we were the minority of Sri Lanka. Two, religious violence because because we were the only Christian in that whole village. Imagine I was expecting my first child at that time. And when I visited the house, I blamed nobody else but God. But as I walked through the gate uh, to the, my yard, I found a little plate with half burned. Says, my God, my God. And uh, going, my, uh, my grace is sufficient for thee. That had, I had no words but to keep silent. Two years later, we moved from the tea plantation looking for a house in Colombo. Abraham and I, no other option but to settle down in the same house. The government of Sri Lanka and another para church rebuilt and resettled us in the same vicinity. In 1991, we were moved to hand over, hand over the property to the Lord. Today, the very house, which was demolished, has become a place of worship. Amazingly, the parliament, the sophisticated, sophisticated hospital and department of education, and many more have merge in the surrounding. As William Carey, I too believe that our extremity is God's opportunity. This is my marvelous story I could recollect. Beautiful, Mercy. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate you sharing it with such emotion and I know we all felt it, so thank you. Appreciate you sharing your energy with us. Thank you so much, Marcy. All right. And up next, we have Miss Ann. Miss Ann is representing the Soundview Development. She is the TA president there and has been a vibrant addition to our group. Please give a warm welcome to Ann. Hold on, Ann, we can't hear you. Hold on one second. I'm gonna make sure I unmute you or if you can unmute yourself. Okay. Hey, um, there you go, um, Ann. <laughs> Hi, Stephanie, and thank you so much for the great words. Yes, I'm the TA president of Salvi Houses in the Bronx and I've been at this job for about eight years. And somehow they keep electing me. Like you say, I, I'm a go-getter. I love what I do. I love working with my development, all 2,500 of them. And um, I love doing things for them, what, they, what their needs are. I try to reach out to elected officials and I try to help them get things taken care of in a timely fashion. 
Well, needless to say, I'm coming to you to speak about what happened to me on 9-14 of this year. On July 7th, I have what you call a family day, which um, I have like a little celebration. People in the neighborhood and people um, are in the surrounding neighborhoods come out, we eat and we have music by our old school DJs and stuff. But prior to that, what I do, I go out and I pick up sodas and waters and food and juices and I carry them in my little wagon to my office. And basically, I think I kind of like overdid it because on the 14th, I came down what you call came down with what you call sciatica. And it affected my hip, my pelvis, my knee, my ankle. I had no idea what was going on when I got out of bed that morning. And shortly after me getting dressed, I called 911. I was taken to the hospital and they diagnosed me with fractured pelvis. And I had no idea how that could have happened because I hadn't fallen and they kept asking me, did you fall? So I told them no. And um, between the um, X-ray and the uh, CAT scan, it showed basically that I had sciatica, it wasn't a fractured pelvis. Well, I can tell you now that that pain was humongous. I was yelling and screaming the whole time I was in the emergency room and they kept giving me medication. They gave me Percocet, they gave me um, Tylenol, they gave me um, some other type of high power drug. And it seems like it did not kill the pain in my right hip or my leg or my knee. So basically they said that as long as I'm still, as long as I'm calm, it should go away. And of course they were right. They even gave me morphine, which didn't kill the pain unless I was calm. But as soon as my body got calm, the doctor would come in and say, How's the pain in your right leg? And they touch my leg and here come the pain back again. So back to my yelling and screaming. And I had no idea how it could have happened. But as I speak to doctors now, um, I have gone to a physical therapist. They've given me lidocaine injections, which helps. It helps a little, but um, Thank God I have a goddaughter whose husband is a, um, a massage therapist. And they sent me some cream called, it's CBD cream and it's a uh, pain relief oint, uh, ointment. And the one that they sent me is for pro sports. That's the most um, severe level that they could use, that they could, that anybody I guess could take. So I put it on my hip, my knee, my ankle, and the pain like went away like in two minutes. And I was like, oh my God, this is some good stuff. So I found out that it cost $224 <laughs> for this little container, this little thing, like three ounces. So I'm using it sparingly and it works. And um, I don't know if anyone in this group has suffered from sciatica. I do know it's pain that radiates down, you say both legs, and it could also affect the, um, the hip, the knee, the shoulder. And um, I wouldn't wish that on anyone for the type of pain that I've gone through. And I plan on continuing with my follow-up care with my um, physical therapist, continue with these pain pills and I'm not really crazy about pain pills, but the injections that I received, the lidocaine injections, it helps. It really helps. And um, thank you guys for listening. However, I like to end um, my presentation with a little joke, something, a little, a little icebreaker. Um, my godfather, he was a storyteller, and he told me one day that he says that this guy was, um, he was drunk. He says, this drunk guy walking through the cemetery and he fell into an open grave. And there was another guy walking through and he heard this boy saying, it's cold down here, it's cold down here. 
And so the guy that was walking through that heard the voice, he says, where are you at? He says, I'm over here. So the other drunk person looks down and say, no wonder you cold, you kicked all the dirt off of you. <laughs> Get it? <laughs> <laughs> thank you guys for listening. <laughs> and thank you, Stephanie, so much. Thank you, Anne. Yep. Thank you so much. Um, and I appreciate you sharing. And I think we all as human beings always need to find more ways to have awareness and compassion for each other. So thank you for bringing awareness to all of us. All right. Um, we are, we still have lots, we still have a few more stories um, to go. So for those of you, please um, continue to be with us. Uh, but for right now, um, it is very important for us as an organization, Life Story Club, to be able to serve our participants and all of you um, in the best way we can. So we are actually going to do a, a quick, a tiny quick little break. Don't go nowhere, okay? Stay right there. Um, but we're gonna do a poll because uh, we need to gather information in order to serve all of you and our participants better. So please, um, you are going to see a quick poll that is gonna pop up. Um, it literally will take less than a minute to complete. So if you all can please um, take the time to, to do that poll, it should be popping up right now. So please take a few minutes to, um, to, to complete that poll for us. And if you would like any more information about the Life Story Club, what we do, our continue, our, what our get up to date information on our continued work with NYCHA, all you have to do is check out our website. Um, there is a QR code on the screen um, that shows, um, that will take you to our website so you can learn a little bit more about what we do. So thank you all for, for taking the time um, to, to um, provide that information for us. And we're just going to take us uh, literally a minute break, and then we're going to come right back and we're going to finish the show. So thank you all. Be back in un minuto. Thank you all so much. Thank you, thank you for taking the time to complete that for us. Um, it is much appreciated. All right, we're gonna go right back into it because we have 
um, more stories for all of you. Um, all right. So our next storyteller is um, El Señor Félix. Uh, Félix is a retired post office worker and veteran. Y él también está representando Washington Houses. And um, I'm so grateful to, to Félix and, um, and his wife always for being such committed members of our community. Um, uh, Felix is going to be sharing his story in Spanish. So we're going to do the same thing. We're going to have the translation. So just please give us just a few seconds to get all of that together, okay? Um, uh, fui obligado a ir al servicio militar de Estados Unidos. Yo salí de Puerto Rico, de un aeropuerto que era uh, en Aguadilla, Puerto Rico, que era un, un, un puerto, una base militar. Salimos de, de Aguadilla para Char Charleston, South Carolina. Yo nunca había viajado en, en una nave. Y me tocó al lado de la ventana y era, la nave era de hélice, lo que se llama en inglés palpelo, ¿sabes? Y al lado de la ala, pues, están los mofles como los carros, que tú ves cuando sale el humo del motor y todo. A mitad de viaje, ese motor que donde yo iba al lado de la ala empezó a coger fuego. Pero como yo nunca sabía nada de eso, yo estaba tranquilito. Hasta la que la camarera vino y nos dijo, se tienen que quitar los zapatos, bajar la cabeza. Y yo le dije, ¿por qué? Y me dijo, por el motor al lado tuyo está cogiendo fuego. Tenemos que retornar otra vez a, la base, a Guadilla. Ese es el pueblo donde está la base militar. Volvimos otra vez, aterrizamos. Yo tuve que brincar por la puerta de emergencia, perdí y uno de mis zapatos. Yo fui el último en regresar a mi casa porque tuvieron que buscarme unos zapatos y todo eso. Cuando llegué a mi casa, mi mamá se puso contenta. <ríe> y, yo, y yo nunca le dije la verdad lo que había pasado. Volvimos a salir dos semanas después. Llegué a Charleston y de ahí a las, a las 3 de la mañana nos llevaron a, a Fort Jackson, donde, donde trenean a los, a los militares. Ahí eran como los, los grupos puertorriqueños, nos regaron, unos sabían bastante inglés, otros no sabían, yo gracias a Dios sabía bastante. Empezamos a trenear ahí, nos defendieron uno al otro porque había en, en mucho, había en ese tiempo, usted te va a hablar, del 1964, había mucho racismo en South Carolina. No, no, el, cuando estaban los libres que querían ir al cine, iban a Colombia, que es la capital de, de, de South Carolina, o sea, Carolina del Sur. La, el, una parte de la, de, de la avenida principal, los cines son, eran para los, yo no sé si todavía existe, eran para la gente negra y, y otros eran para la gente blanca. Yo iba a entrar a un cine de los negros, no me dejaban porque decían que yo era blanco. Iba a entrar a un cine de los blancos y no me dejaban porque decían que yo era negro. Tenía que llamar a un policía militar para que me dejara para que me llevara al cine, al teatro, y él, él me, dio, me, me dio la hora cuando se acababa la película y, me, y nos iban a buscar. Eso fue una, un, una tortura grande para, para, para los puertorriqueños. Porque para, no, no, nosotros, no, en Puerto Rico no había eso de, de racismo. De ahí empezamos a trenear y treníamos juntos lo raro es que cuando tú estás treinando en el servicio militar, 
el negro y el hispano y el blanco se llevan bien. Pero cuando van a la vida real, que vuelven, vuelven a su, su vida, vuelven con el racismo. Muchas veces yo tuve que... De, 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 cuando venía de pase de, de, de Colombia para, para base militar, el chofer me decía, te tienes que ir para la cocina, la cocina, ya ah, tú tu the kitchen. The kitchen era la parte de atrás de la guagua. Y te, con sinceridad te digo, dos veces tuve que pelear con el mismo chofer, porque no me gustaba, ya no lo aguantaba más. Muchas veces me llevaron a un consejo militar y cuando yo le explicaba, ellos me decían, aquí tiene que soportar eso. Y yo, no, yo no lo voy a soportar. Yo tuve que buscar un chaplin. Un chaplin es como un cura, un pastor, donde te aconsejan de qué manera este, bregar con ese problema. Bueno, pude bregar con el problema para hacer training, gracias a Dios me mandaron a, a California por un mes, de California me mandaron a Alemania. Ya en Alemania era diferente. En Alemania ya no había ese racismo, ya no, no los, 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 los blancos y los prietos, aunque no les gustara, tenían que llevarse bien, no podía haber pelea. Sí, había peleas, claro que sí, peleaban no. Pero no le iban de pase, porque no iban a la, a la ciudad. De, a, de, 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 en, ese, en ese tiempo yo estaba en una ciudad alemana que se llama Kassel. Yo fui a, Mü a Múnich primero. De Múnich me mandaron a Kassel Lotte. Y en, en esa ciudad de Kassel Lotte, pues, era joven, era joven. No, no, no iban a, a, a pasar un buen tiempo en la ciudad, a beber. Y eso, se formaban peleas. Pero nada de, de, de... Porque en Alemania, la, en ese tiempo, la, la ley de la, 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 la policía militares son fuertes. Pero ellos mismos te traían al fuerte si tú no llegabas solo. Si eras culpable, tenía que enfrentar la justicia alemana. Si eras inocente, pues no, yo no tuve problema, pero yo nunca... Los problemas que tuve de pelear fue por, por defensa propia. Pero en Estados Unidos, ahí en su Carolina, la vida es, no fue bien dura con el jacismo que había. Pero pasaron los, los dos años y medio en Alemania, volví a Puerto Rico y gracias a Dios, pues, no pasé nada. Y era la, 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 era la era de Vietnam, cuando me llamaron. Tuve suelto, mala suerte que no, no me mandaron a Vietnam porque yo quería ir. Pero no, cuatro puertorriqueños nos dijeron, no, ustedes se van a Alemania. Y así fue que pasó. Y esa ha sido la historia más triste de mi vida. Porque yo no esperaba que en este país hubiera un racismo tan fuerte en, en ese... En ese eh, Muchas gracias, Félix. Muchas gracias, Félix. And Félix está ahí en la cámara. Félix, thank you for your service. Muchas gracias por tu servicio. <laughs> hola, Félix. Y Lidia, Lidia está ahí también. Lidia, si quieres decir hola. Muchas gracias a ustedes dos. Oh, no, no, no le oímos, perdón. Um, espérate. Si quieres en el teléfono, preta uh, el botón, el estrella y seis. Ok. ¿Quieren okay. decir hola rapidito? Hola. Hola. Sí. Muchas gracias por compartir a ustedes dos. Sí, gracias, okay, a usted gracias, gracias a ti. Bendiciones. Bendiciones. Oye, la voz mía se oye bien. ¿eh? Ah, no, pero tienes un voz bien. Sí. 
<risa> Gracias, Lidia y Félix. Lo agradezco mucho. Um, ok, ahora, um, now we have, um, we have two more storytellers. Our next storyteller is Abraham. Uh, you all saw him earlier. Mr. Abraham is a man of faith, family, and values. And his passion for his home country, for education, and his family all um, inspired his story today. So please take it away, Abraham. I'm just going to unmute you, okay? There you go. Okay. You're good. We hear you. Okay. Thank you. Well, that, uh, so uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I'm Abraham Punaya. And uh, you have already heard my wife uh, uh, sharing a story. Uh, so now uh, we are glad to meet uh, meet you all, and and I want to give a special thanks to Stephanie for organizing this uh, wonderful life storytelling event. Uh, it's a good opportunity for us to share our stories, and we heard so many stories, and it's very encouraging. Also, thank you very much. So now to begin with, uh, 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 I have a story also oh, to share with you. Well, we are from Sri Lanka, an island of South India. As a teenager, I always had an idea of uh, going to a foreign country as my family was a family of eight siblings. And uh, uh, I was the seventh uh, child. I just want to show you uh, my extended family here. Of course, I am not, we both are not there, but this was taken about uh, five years back in Sri Lanka with all my family members that come to my, come for my uh, Navy's ordination, he was ordained as an archdeacon of a uh, certain district in Sri Lanka. So they all came for that, and at that time they had taken the picture. Well, so so I had a desire to go to a foreign country, but that uh, uh, never materialized. Uh, anyway, in 1983, we got married and uh, we had three children. Of course, after our marriage, uh, I worked only for two years uh, in a tea plantation uh, sector. Uh, as the head of the human resources department there. Thereafter, we both uh, left the tea estate sector and joined Christian ministry where we were uh, training Sunday school teachers and conducted many children programs all over Sri Lanka. One thing I must admit here that it was uh, my wife who was uh, much involved in it and I was in charge of the administration. It grew, grew up so much, finally at the correct time after 20 years, God opened the door for my family to migrate to USA and a lottery visa. It was a sad, it was really sad. Uh, we could not bring our daughter as she was over 21 years of age at that time. Anyway, we gave her in marriage to her, her fiance and now they have two children and involved in the ministry, what we were doing. So when we arrived in New York uh, in July, 2006, my sister-in-law, Mrs. Grace Christopher, welcomed our family into her home and gave us the initial support. By the time my two boys completed their college studies while working in the bank. Later, both of them got settled down in, I mean, in responsible jobs. They got married and one is having two children and the other one is expecting the first baby in December this year after eight years of their marriage. I want to thank God for this gift that God is giving my son. In the meantime, we both are now senior citizens, and thank God we got an apartment on the NYCHA program and peacefully settled down here. By staying here, we both are still actively involved in Christian work as volunteers. And so, therefore, we want to thank God and also NYCHA for looking after us very well. It's a, it's a, it's a great blessing for us that we both have, both of us, although we are now living separately, but we have everything here. We are looked after very well by NYCHA. Thank God and thank them also. So thank you also for listening to our story and God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you, Abraham. Thank you, you're welcome. So happy that we were able to showcase both of your stories. Thank you, Abraham and Mercy again. Really appreciate your energy. Um, they have been such a vital part of our community, and thank you again. Okay, now for the grand finale, and I just want to thank everyone who has stayed on the line and supporting one another and supporting our storytellers today. 
We have la maravillosa Maria Pacheco. Hello. Maria has been a leader in this group and her community at Yupaca 6. Many times she's joined while simultaneously doing COVID testing or serving hot meals to her residents in, the, in her building. Um, and uh, Maria's story about creating a legacy of helping one another um, is, is, is going to inspire all of you. Y María, lo vas a hacer en español, ¿verdad? Sí, la, la última historia que hice, la que está en el libro. Okay, so yo tengo, I have the translations. María is going to do the story in, I think, Spanglish. Spanish, but some English uh -huh. is going to come out, right, María? Como siempre. <laughs> <laughs> uh, also, cuido a mis niñas. Como de. <laughs> okay. Amiga, te. Quisiera decirle la historia que hizo, me impactó mucho en la vida y me inspiró a servir a los vecinos eh, eh, atendiendo en, en los centros de gente mayores. Yo empecé aquí en, en donde, donde vivo, en un, un edificio de gente mayores, en Baca 6, que está en Harlem, Lexington Avenue. Yo me mudé aquí porque yo me hice, me hizo miembro, me hice miembro de un senior center. Y empecé en ese senior center porque yo rescaté a una vecina que era no, era no compañera de salir a, a vacilar, a bailar en los clubs, pero una noche muy jovencita ella, se le dio la enfermedad de Alzheimer's. Y ella no tenía ni, ni 60 años, como 60 años tenía, no más de eso. Y una, un día fue al cine, un centro donde ella iba, y se salió y se perdió. Tuvimos que, que poner este, cartelones en todo el barrio para que la gente la localizara, la encontrara. Pusimos desde la 80 hasta la 125 y preguntándole a todo el mundo que consiguieran a mi vecina, a mi amiga. Un día ella apareció por un edificio, un, un conserje, la encontró y llamó. Cuando la, re, la encontraron, la rescataron, la llevaron a la casa, vivíamos en el mismo building. Y yo me hice cargo de ella. Le dije a la familia, yo la atiendo, yo la cuido, porque ella estaba retirada, no, no estaba haciendo nada. Y así fue que comencé a, a empezar a los senior centers, a los centros de gente mayores, envejecida. La llevaba a ella, porque me iba a volver loca en la casa atendiéndola, porque yo no estoy cualificada para ese trabajo, lo hice por amor y por cariño. Entonces... Yo la llevé al senior center, ahí fue que empecé a, a trabajar con los gente mayores. La señora estaba tan mala, estaba tan malita, que no, no, no encontraba, no sabía ni cómo comer. Este, y, y dio la casualidad que el primer día que yo la llevé al, al centro, empezaron un programa para la gente deshabilitada, que los traían en Guagua y eso. Y ella fue la primera que me escribieron el programa. Ahí fue que yo comencé a ayudar a los otros. Ayudándola a ella, ayudando a los otros y ayudándome a mí, porque yo me mantenía siempre activa. Ahí aprendí, gracias a, a la persona que, que me enseñó a hacer prenda, a Jane Richardson. Yo, este... Ya no podía más con la señora, no podía más porque ella estaba bien enferma y ella necesitaba ayuda profesional, no como yo. Y ella estaba en su cama, que ya no podía caminar, no podía comer, no podía. Hubo tiempos que, que hasta, hasta la, la nieta mía y mi hija le daban coraje porque la gente que la cuidaban no, no sabían cómo darle la comida y la trataban mal. Pero anyway. Ahí yo dejé de cuidarla, dije que buscaran a alguien, algún profesional que la cuidara. 
pero me ayudó ella al mismo tiempo, me ayudó a mí, porque ahí yo comencé a aprender a hacer prendas, a ayudarle a la gente, a los otros seniors que no podían, le aguantaba la mano, los ayudaba. Entonces, este, con, con Jane Richardson, que trajo una persona a enseñar a hacer prendas, fue que yo aprendí. Y de ahí yo me hice una consultant, ayudar a los otros senior centers. En los senior centers, trabajaba en cuatro. Y también me hice uh, senior body. Uh, visitaba los lo, lo que estaban en la casa homebound. Este, de ahí comencé a ayudar en el building, en el edificio donde yo vivo ahora. Y lo conseguí a través de ser bien, de estar ayudando a los senior centers. Había un programa de, de outreach y me dieron una aplicación y conseguí apartamento aquí donde estoy ahora. Y aquí he estado más ocupada ayudando a los, a los demás. También yo me hice, empecé en, como secretaria, después tesorera y actualmente soy la presidenta de, del building donde vivo. Y también soy miembro de los demócratas, de la comunidad de Voces Unidas. Y aquí como, como presidenta le busco mucho, mucho, muchas actividades para que la gente esté ocupada, que no se vuelvan locas, que crezcan este, decentemente, como debe ser todo, toda la gente mayor, con dignidad. Le traigo... Mucha, mucho servicio para que ellos estén ocupados, pero al mismo tiempo me ayudan a mí, porque si no ven, si ven la camisa que tengo, vintage, 80 años, nací en el 941, aquí lo dice, y no quiero ponerme vieja, so me, me mantengo ocupada haciendo servicio, porque hay, hay un Dios arriba que ve lo que uno hace, no necesito pago, y necesito que me den en la espalda. Lo hago con cariño al prójimo. Gracias por oír mi historia. Gracias, María. Okay. María, we didn't see the full shirt. Put it up again. Oh, okay. Vintage, 1941, okay. 80. ¿Cómo es que más dice? 80. Oh, so oh, 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 esta es esta mi baby, mi nieta. Hola, mi amor. My little, my little granddaughter. Gracias. Me. Ay, Dios mío. Yo, I don't know if I said it right, pero me estaba. You, si did, lo... it, you did it perfectly. Thank you so much, María. Yeah. Es que todavía me pongo nerviosa siempre cuando hablo con tanta gente bella. Ay, no, pero te salió mejor que el otro. Entonces, gracias. Thank you, María, so much. Uh, María has been such a blessing. And María and I actually met for the first time yes. in person this week, uh, which was a very big blessing and honor for me because we, María and, you know, our whole community has also, you know, we've provided community to each other. I, you know, I'm very grateful um, for our bonds and our community. So thank you, Maria. Can, and I, can I tell you something? There's someone, he's a band leader, el trompista del barrio, and he feels so grateful that he's given us all expense party next Sunday in our backyard, live music, salsa dancing, You're all invited. <laughs> and good, and there's going to be some good food there. Yes. Yes, yes. daughter is going to cook. You don't want to miss it if you're around. Felix y Lidia, ahí están bien servidos. Give the address. <laughs> yeah. Yupaca, Yupaca 6, 1940, right here. 1940, Lexington on um, September 26th. Yes. Thank you, Maria, and thank Sunday, you for all your leadership. From 12 to 6, yeah. <laughs> thank you, Maria, for all your leadership. And um, thank you, everyone, to our all our wonderful storytellers today. 
Thank you, thank you. A round of applause to everyone. Um, muchas gracias a todos que participaron, que, que pusieron tu, tu historia, tu energía. And thank you for everyone. Um, yes, yes. Get the book. We, we have a chat book coming. This event will be um, a publication as well. So thank you all for, for joining us. And I'm going to kick it off to um, our founder, Lily, to do an official goodbye to everybody. Well, I just want to say huge, huge, huge round of applause to our host, Stephanie. If you love what we do, visit our website at lifestoryclub.org to see how you can get involved with our work. Thank you again and hope to see you guys again soon at a future event. We'll thank you, Lily. Thank, thank you, Lily. You. This was inspiring. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Have a good What's weekend. The the function? Hi, Maria. Take care, everybody. Hi. Goodbye, this is Ona. Goodbye, Bye, everybody. Oh, Ona, Bye, everybody. Yeah, how are you doing? Bye, everybody. Huh? Hi, Mr. Collins. Hi, Mr. Collins. You Hi. never know when you're going to meet Mr. people. Chico. I okay. know, I know. <laughs> All right, everybody. Okay. Bye-bye now. Have a good weekend, everyone. Thank you, everybody, Thank for sharing. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Stephanie, take care. I appreciate Bye. you Take guys. Bye. Job Pacheco. well done. Job well done. Mercy, Excellent job. Excellent job. Okay. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Beautiful stories, you. Felix. Hey. Thank, you. Thank you, everyone, for staying on and supporting. Appreciate you. All right, Stephanie. All right. Love the story. Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody. What a good way to end, start a weekend. Thank you for all those wonderful stories. I'm leaving. Look, my smile can't get any bigger. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it was excellent. Thank you all so much. You're welcome. And everybody. And anyone who's on the line who hasn't joined the Life Story Club, make sure you join us, please. Um, you know, if you are a resident of NYCHA and you would like to, to participate, all are welcome at all times. So once we start a new series, more than welcome. You see here, we're, we're open. Uh, we always have our arms open. So please join us. Yes. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful weekend. And Thank I will you. talk to all of you very soon. All right, you too. Bendiciones, bendiciones. Bendiciones. Bye. 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 Bye.